Okay, you read this and then you see a contradiction right off the bat at the very beginning of, of the world. The first blessing of God is a fruitful womb that for the man and the woman that were made in his image. But then what's the first fruit of the womb? What does he do? He murders his brother. You know, so there's not really much of a blessing in murder, is there? Now, irony isn't the disruption of human history, but it's rather it's dull and predictable constant because sin permeates everything good and poisons men against God's gifts. The greatest gift of marriage is children. and God institutes marriage for the sake of the children, and God protects marriage for the sake of the children. Now, the pro-abortion uh, canard that pro-lifers care more about life in the abstract than we do about life in the concrete might have a little bit of truth to it because we do affirm in our hearts that what God says is precious is precious, but then we fail to recognize in the concrete day-to-day -day struggle in life that what God says is precious is precious, even when it brings us a whole lot of pain. How many of you have, have children? Wow. Most of you do. I'll tell you a little bit about kids. They'll cost you more than you can pay. They will disrupt your duties and your pleasures, your goals and your dinner. They will wreck your stuff. They will mess with your things. They'll keep you awake all night and make you worry. And this is when they're all healthy and safe and secure in the home. When they suffer from sickness, when they fall into sin, when they suffer personal failures, all of this cuts you and hurts you as what God says are blessings are sources of pain. We see in our children our sins. We teach them bad habits. And the prophets and prophetesses of our day teach us to follow our hearts. I guarantee you, who's, you know, I didn't turn the stupid cell phone off. It's not one of you. <laughs> oh. Now, now I'm distracted. <laughs> Anybody know Clint Poppy? Yeah, that, that's him. Wonder what he wants to talk about. Well, anyhow, should, should, we put it on, should we put it on speaker and put him on the spot? That would be fun. No, anyway, the prophets and prophetesses of our, of our day teach us to follow our hearts. I guarantee you that we will not regard children as blessings from God if we look within ourselves and, and follow our hearts. Because one day the child will be a blessing, and the next day he'll be a curse. Our hearts are deceitful liars. Instead, we listen to the word of God, and this is what it says. Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Since it's God who blesses us, it is God who tells us what a blessing is. Wine, money, power, position may be blessings. And they may also be curses. It all depends on how they're used or abused. The Bible never presents children as curses. Children are always identified as blessings. The psalmist says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your home. Your children, like olive plants all around your table, behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. Psalm 128, 1 to 4. Now, the reason that among all the temporal blessings in this life, children are unique as being characterized consistently as blessings is because they're not like any other temporal blessing. 
like us, they're created in the image of God. And they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, and they're sanctified by, Holy, by the Holy Spirit in the waters of holy baptism. So their inherent dignity and value is an article of faith. You can't prove a human being has value because he is a human being. Any more than you can prove that a human being is made in the image of God. It's just not empirically demonstrable. We confess, I believe that God has made me. And the God who made me is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're baptized by the authority of Jesus and in baptism, we put on Christ and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Christian cannot even conceive of God as Father apart from being born again by the Holy Spirit. And the creative act by which God made Adam and Eve in paradise is the creative act by which he makes us and our children. Did you get that? It's the same act. Christians don't look at the propagation of the human race in mechanistic, naturalistic, biological terms, but we, we, we look at the God who has made us, and He is the God who richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me from all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. And all this purely out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me, for all which it is my duty to thank and praise to serve and obey him, this is most certainly true. We cannot separate the creative work of God in bringing us new life into this world from God's fatherly care for his children. Now, I don't know the word providence. Do you pastors teach the word, pro I teach the word providence to my catechumens, but it's not really a very nice word. It's kind of cold. It reminds me of a place in, in Rhode Island. <laughs> it's what our father does. This is our father's world. It's what the father does for his children. That's what we're talking about. And God is always our father for the sake of the vicarious obedience and suffering of his only begotten son, our, our savior, our brother, our Father isn't our Father. Our Father is our Father on account of the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, who, when we were dead in trespasses and sin, made us alive with Christ. So there is no such thing as a generic fatherhood of God concept, and then we assent to that, and then we deduce things from that. No. There is our Father in heaven to whom we pray, and the petition we pray, give us this day our daily bread, includes all the necessities of life, including everything needed for our children and our grandchildren. Now, I know there cannot be a more personal issue than the issue of childbearing and child rearing. And there's no greater treasure in life than the lives of our children. The reason folks feel passionate about this about children and the debates about abortion, birth control, family planning reveal a lot of this passion, is the way that God has wired men and women. Uh, we're different. Nobody's going to argue that. And much of the popular wisdom about marriage and children is a mishmash of truth and fiction, wisdom and folly. Romantic stories, songs, Poems, plays, movies, and truisms abound, and every once in a while, the wisdom of the world brings some sanity and maybe even a little bit of illumina uh, illumination on the subject. Uh, when it comes to marriage and children, I would recommend that you read uh, Rudyard's, Rudyard Kipling's The Female of the Species. <laughs> it's great. And the thing of it is, is, she's deadlier than the male, and she has to be because the survival depends on it. If you want to read something from the social sciences, here I'm going to date myself, but that's okay. George Gilder's 1973 book, Sexual Suicide. It was republished in 1986 under the title Men in Marriage. I think it's the most brilliant treatment 
of the feminist assault against motherhood. He writes like a sociologist because that's what he is. What God reveals in Holy Scripture about the fruit of children being the first and primary blessing of marriage is confirmed by natural law, and this is affirmed by the wisdom of the ages. The nature of marriage as the lifelong union of one man and one woman who are faithfully devoted to each other is closely related to procreation as the primary benefit of marriage. Now here I want to make something very clear. To say the primary benefit of marriage is children is not to deny that marriage is marriage when not blessed with children. We're talking about a general principle and not an irresistible law that will apply in every specific marriage. God only knows why he chooses to bless this marriage with many children while he withholds his blessing from others. That being childless in the Old Testament was a, a, a reproach is clear from the examples of Sarah, Hannah, Elizabeth, and others. But God blesses this marriage with children, and he withholds his blessing from that marriage. Why? That's God's business, not ours. And we may rejoice and we may mourn, but nobody can deny that it affects us deeply. But listen, we do not ever have the right to speculate about God's will for us or to try to pry into the hidden mind of God and construct a theory about what, why he does what he does and why he doesn't do what he doesn't do. That's presumption. What we know about God, we know in his written word. And we know that he does withhold the fruit of the womb after Leah had, been, had her fourth child, her fourth son, actually, Judah, Rachel, who had no children, was overcome with envy against her. She said to her husband, Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob responded in righteous anger against Rachel's presumption that family planning is a human prerogative. And he said to her, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So God opens the womb, God closes the womb, and God knows why. That barrenness is no longer the social stigma it was in biblical times is not because people are more sensitive today to the pain of barren women, but rather because they're not, but it's because children are not valued as they once were. Replacing theology with sociology and interpreting the Holy Scriptures sociologically will yield whatever conclusion you want it to yield. And it's no surprise that subjecting the sacred text to the canons of the social sciences has yielded insight. <laughs> I'll put that in quotes. That for people of biblical times, have you heard this? If, if you've heard this, let, raise your hand. An agrarian economy coupled with an arid climate made the reproduction of children an economic necessity. Did you ever hear that one? <laughs> I love it. But in our less labor-intensive economy, with the high cost of childbearing, child-rearing, with experts telling us how many hundreds of thousands of dollars a child is going to cost to raise the reproduction of children is an economic liability. All right. Subordinating the biblical text to the so-called social sciences leads to bad theology. Scriptures are prescriptively normative. Sociology is descriptively normative. Now, human nature, being what it is, what is descriptively normative will be regarded as prescriptively normative. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you just call it the herd instinct. People don't think things through. They follow the crowd. And on the matter of the blessing of children and the issues of birth control, family planning, and so forth, what is normative descriptively, that is, what is going on, becomes normative prescriptively. Everybody's doing it. This is the 21st century. Get with it. And any comment and this usually doesn't rise to the level of an argument, that appeals to the way things are, for the way things ought to be, 
is an argument that the descriptive reflects the prescriptive. Now that represents the triumph of the social sciences over theology in the interpretation of the Bible and in the faith and life of the people. Demographic statistics such as birth rates, population density, economic growth, and so forth are gathered together in service to whatever theological agenda one has. And you can see the intrusion of the social sciences in the debates about birth control and family planning in the Missouri Synod a long time ago. Earlier in the 20th century, two influential Missouri Synod theologians will illustrate this for us. In 1954, Walter A. Meyer wrote a book, For Better, Not For Worse, in which he presented the traditional Lutheran argument against birth control. In 1959, Alfred Raywinkle wrote a book, Planned Parenthood and Birth Control in Light of Christian Ethics. He broke with tradition and argued in favor of birth control. Now, I knew Alfred Raywinkle. He was no liberal. He had established his conservative bona fides several years earlier with his book, The Flood in Light of the Bible, Geology, and Archaeology. But Ray Winkle never, he never wavered from his devotion to the inerrancy of the Holy Scriptures. But both Meyer and Ray Winkle relied heavily on the social sciences in their argument for their respective positions. You can check these books out and see for yourself. And now you read these books in the 21st century, and you know what you see? You see how fleeting the assured results of the social sciences are. It, it becomes passe very quickly, and you would find so many of the arguments rather absurd. So we don't need to demonstrate that children are blessings from God by pointing to the social cost of planned barrenness or to the social benefit of large families. I mean, I can share anecdotes and stories. I'd love to do it. I grew up in a large family. I, my mom and dad had 10 children, and uh, God blessed us with 12 children. Uh, Mark here, he's my son. They have eight children. <coughs> And so I could share my experiences uh, with large families with you. But you know what? A sincere Pentecostal can share with you how speaking in tongues has drawn him closer to God. Should you promote tongue speaking in your congregation as a sign of a spirit-filled, victorious life? Well, personal experience does not constitute a theological argument. And nor can it do anything more than to confirm what the Bible actually says. So I'm not going to prove children are a blessing from God by pointing to how God has blessed me through my children. The fact is that God's in charge. And when we are dealing with an article of faith, we do not depend on what we see. Because faith doesn't go by what we see. It's an article of faith that children are a blessing from God. Faith lives on the Word of God. And we don't believe because we see. We see in order to believe. I think Augustine said that, didn't he? He said some good things. Grounding faith in what is visible to our eyes deprives faith of its source and strength. Once faith is severed from its source and strength in the Word of God, then enthusiasm takes the place of faith. Well, let's talk just a little bit <clears throat> about uh, family planning, contraception, and birth control. I, can I tell it? I think I have time for a joke. <clears throat> the Italian, you heard about the Italian woman who, very pious Catholic lady, who uh, after having 10 kids decided she's going to start practicing birth control. And her priest started lecturing her about it. And what does she say to the priest? You know play it a game, you know make it a rules. <laughs> so, 
I think Rome lacks a little bit of credibility, but pop, popular opinion has it that the Roman Catholic Church is opposed to family planning and the Protestants are in favor of it, but that's not true. Rome opposes contraception. It does not oppose birth control. Rome teaches that there can be no artificial barrier between sexual intercourse and conception. But Rome favors birth control. The Roman Catholic Church teaches family planning that you may decide whether or not to have more children. It's your decision to make. But you have to follow the rules. And what do you call a woman who practices the rhythm method? <laughs> You've all heard that one. Okay. The, ro the rules don't prohibit birth control. It's just assumed that you will practice birth control. For Rome, birth control is subsumed under the sixth commandment. Now, this is important because uh, you'll say, okay, fine, we're talking about sex, and that has to do with the sixth commandment, obviously. But there's something just as obvious, and that is that the matter of family planning or birth control can't possibly be primarily a sixth commandment issue. It is a first article issue. Our Heavenly Father blesses us with children. That's an article of faith. And God chooses to use sexual intercourse between a man and a woman as the means by which he'll bring children into this world. That's perfectly true. But let me make a distinction here. Sexual intimacy is simply the means that God has chosen to bring new life into the world. God's will is the cause. For example, the minister doesn't cause faith in those who hear his words. God does. But God works faith where and when he pleases in those who hear the gospel. I've never met a preacher who ever regenerated anybody. No preacher does it. The gospel is the power, not the preacher. Just so God blesses marriage. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. The divine blessing of Adam and Eve in paradise at the beginning of time is the divine blessing until the end of time of the conjugal union between a husband and wife as the means by which God will bring children into this world. Addressing the Roman Catholic requirement of priestly celibacy in the Augsburg Confession, article, in the Apology, excuse me, Article 23, Philip Melanchthon refers to Rome's argument that applied, that they argued that Genesis 128 didn't apply anymore because the, the world had already been replenished. And Melanchthon refutes Rome's argument by pointing to the fact, what does he argue to? Marital desire. Well, where'd you get that from? Where'd you get the desire? Of course. So if you have the desire for a man or a woman, now we're assuming a heterosexual desire here, that desire proves that God commands marriage. Because that's the only place that desire can be fulfilled in the God-pleasing way. And that children are still a blessing of marriage. So as long as human nature remains how God created it, then the, law, uh, the command to be fruitful will endure. Now the joy of the marriage bed is a privilege that God in his love gives to us to enjoy. That this is the means by which God brings new life into this world doesn't make us authors of life. Husbands and wives don't make babies any more than preachers make Christians. But we parents and pastors are given the joyful task of serving as God's instruments as he blesses us with life both temporal and, and eternal. Let's talk a little bit about desire and receiving a gift. Some people don't want to go to church. I don't understand. It must be the way you're raised. I once suggested to my father that I didn't have to go to church if I didn't want to. <laughs> I was about 16. I was shocked when he said, I agree with you, Rolf. You don't. I don't have to feed you if I don't want to. <laughs> and you know, I thought through his argument and I decided I really wanted to go to church. 
<laughs> so, so I advocate bringing children to church, even 16-year-old children, whether they want to go or not, just do it. But we know that a gift is accepted in faith and gratitude, and that's the way it is with children. They're gifts from God. We should reject materialistic calculations that measure a child by how much money he'll cost. We should reject selfish assessments that treat children as impediments to our autonomy or our standard of living or our quality of life. Children do not diminish our lives. They enrich us. They provide us with a wealth that no amount of money can buy. The notion that children are a burden to be avoided is grounded in a hedonistic, self-centered, and ultimately vain system of values that will leave its devotees empty, bitter, and all alone. Children are gifts from God. But there can arise circumstances when the health and well-being of the mother would be jeopardized by having more children. There is no rule book to consult. There's what we call sanctified common sense. But a husband will protect his wife from harm. That's his duty. For many Christian couples, the decision to practice birth control is not made out of concern for the health and safety of the mother, but out of a fear of losing something. Cultural mores that combine the dehumanizing values inherent in feminism and materialism promise women liberation from their wombs while enslaving them to a fruitless search for what just isn't there. More and more stuff just leaves her emptier and emptier. And grasping for what is out there blinds her to what is closest to her heart. The greatest honor ever bestowed upon a woman as a woman was bestowed on Mary when she became a mother. She became the mother of God. Christian women become mothers of God's children. From Mary's giving birth to Jesus, all Christian motherhood is sanctified. A culture that denigrates motherhood in the name of women's rights is promoting a lie. Women are not men. God made a woman to be different than a man. And even a woman who does not marry, or if she does marry, has no children, is nevertheless geared as a woman to those things that pertain to the care and nurture of children. Now, we're not going to preserve the dignity of Christian motherhood by setting up a hedge of rules on birth control and family planning. I don't want to offend anybody here, but you know, the Germans have so many rules. Everything is subsumed under rules. Well, there are things other than rules. I, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't really make, mean to make a stab at. But you know, when you're in the Missouri Synod, you have to kind of poke at the Germans, you know? It's just, you feel an obligation. Now I've kind of lost where I was. Oh, oh, no, no, that's not even in the text here, though. Now we're not going to preserve the dignity of Christian motherhood by a bunch of rules. The default position of most Christian couples is that they're going to plan if and when they're going to have children. And I would like to suggest to you that in this context, it would be a waste of time to come up with a list of rules. Instead, we should attack the culture of planned barrenness at its root and extol the blessing of children confess that it is a divine, not a human prerogative to bring human beings into this world. When children are conceived and born, that is the will and work of God. There is no such thing as an unplanned pregnancy. God is the author of life. It is He that has made us and not we ourselves. Well, I'll say amen to that too. So, if you have anything you would like to talk about, either leap off of what I said or respond to what I said, please feel free. We've got another 15 minutes. Question from the floor? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, so, you talked a little bit about when you were 16 and how your dad responded to your local 16 year oldness. So how do you raise teenage boys slash young adults, like when your children are adults, what are the Uh, 
You know what, I, 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 I don't know that I can. I, I raised 12 of them, and uh, <laughs> my, I had six at one time. My wife talks about the 80s as a blur, and for me, the 90s were a blur. I don't even know what happened. But I would say this, that uh, don't get discouraged. Keep on keeping on. Obviously, what you do when the kids are little is going to make the biggest difference when they get bigger because then they've learned to respect your authority and so forth. But don't feel, obviously, if you're, you're a woman, you're speaking as a woman, and you've got a 16-year-old who might be bigger than you are, and so the idea of physical discipline is kind of a, a little bit absurd. You know, this just doesn't work. But I do think that in speaking to the kids, Remember, like we said yesterday, you represent God. Don't ever forget that. Don't let anybody psych you out. And just keep on keeping on. And if you got a pastor, uh, you ask him, could you talk to my 16-year-old for me? I had a 16-year-old boy. His dad was some big shot in some insurance company. This was back in the 80s. Made, I think he must have made, what, a six-figure income back then? So he was very successful, very generous to me. His kid despised him. <laughs> it was terrible. He sends his kid to talk to me. And so I said to the boy, I said, you know, your dad has an awful lot. God's really blessed him. But I'll bet you he'd trade all the money he has for the respect of his son. If you showed him respect, that would be the greatest gift that you could ever give him. So if, you, if any of you have teenage kids that are off, they're just really tough to handle, bring them to a, a pastor or another male Christian figure who can talk a little turkey to them about that. But it's true. I'm honest, I'm the richest man in the world because my children respect me. And what more would you want? Yes, sir. And there's something else, too, when your kids are displaying a certain attitude that makes you uh, upset. You, you, you don't ever think that the constant repetition of basic Christian truths bears no fruit. It does. And you will hear coming out of your kids' mouths what you said to that child. It will come back to you. You have to be patient and persistent and downright stubborn. And when a kid gets this attitude... You know, sometimes we just have to pretend we didn't see it. You know how kids are, as long as we, re, you know, retain control. There was another, yes. Yeah, I was just going back to the concept of when there are people, there are many Christians who say that um, despite everything that you just laid out for us, um, accepting God as the answer for the children, um, to say that, Well, I would, I would say two things. Number one, I could be wrong on this, but in my experience, it has been the men who have pushed for family planning more than the women. Uh, so it's not a matter of a man imposing it. It's a matter of a, of a woman uh, having that pressure put on her. Uh, I'll just share something. Now, this isn't so much theological. I got this from Paul Grimm's wife, 
who's a doctor, uh, and from my, my, my wife, who's a mother, uh, you have a baby and you nurse your baby. <clears throat> Don't just nurse your baby to feed the baby. Nurse your baby to pacify your baby. Get rid of those pacifiers. Throw them away. Because this is what's happening. That kid is sucking on the pacifier instead of the nipple of the mother. And that is hastening the return of the mother to that normal cycle. And if she were to let nature take its course, let the kid nurse as much as he wants, and it's, it's probable that the babies will be spaced approx depending on how fertile she is, between 20 and 24 months. They're not going to be one year after another. And so that does deal a little bit with the issue of boom, 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 because you see these. Now, <laughs> obviously, everybody is different. On the, on the, on the comparing of a, I would object to the comparing of a woman and babies to just about any other thing as far as like, like husband, animal husbandry or, or farming or something like that. But I would say this, and uh, well, uh, a lady who said to me some years back, she'd had a whole bunch of kids, about five kids, and, and uh, I'm not like you prices. I believe in practicing birth control. And I said, well, you, I said, that's all you do is practice. You're obviously not very good at it. Because <laughs> she couldn't. I mean, she didn't seem to work. And I would say that if you have a church that has communion once a month or twice a month, don't, don't have every Sunday communion until the people there actually say, we want every Sunday communion. Don't push a gift of God on them and say, this is a gift, but you're going to do it my way because I'm the pastor and I make the decisions. This is a most precious gift. Now, I have every Sunday communion. I'm very happy I do. And the people come to receive a gift. We don't push this on them. We don't force this on them. We talk about the benefit of the Lord's Supper, right? So what I've talked here about is the benefit of the blessing of children. That's how I would. And so if a woman says, I can't handle the blessing, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge her for that. But, but uh, uh, if they say, well, this is what we're going to do. We've got to pay off our college debts. We've got to get our house. We've got to get the camper. And then we're going to have kids. Oh, you are. I see. So who died and made you God? Maybe you won't. But to st it's the arrogance that we are in charge of life. I, I think that's basically the, the issue that I wanted to make. But there are women, I think, in circumstances where uh, for her own health, it isn't good for her to have more babies. Um, we don't need legalistic rules on that. You know, we exercise common sense. Obviously, there are some things you avoid just because they're not good, like that birth control pill, I think, causes abortion, doesn't it? Yeah, I've heard that it does. She's not gonna, it's not going to prevent fertilization. It'll prevent conception. So you got all these fertilized eggs getting expelled from the body, and we've got issues with that, of course. Yeah. Any other? Yes. How should we respond to polygamy in the Old Testament? I think that if you read the story of how Jacob got his, God has a sense of humor. So Jacob, because he and his mom really don't trust God. They want to do God's job for him. And it looks like Esau is going to get everything that Jacob was supposed to get. And so they, they, con, they, they con poor Isaac. And then what God does is he, he says, okay, you want me to turn you from uh, Jacob into, into Israel? <laughs> I'm going I'm to give you two wives. And so God gives him two wives, and you've got all this bickering and all this mess and I don't know. I think God permitted polygamy, but he never, never condoned it, never, never said it was good, never, certainly never commanded it. I, I think our, our Lutheran emphasis on command and promise is a good one to use here because you have the command and promise of one and one. There's never a command to do a polygamy. It's just not there. 
uh, divorce, Jesus explicitly says uh, he condemns divorce, but he does not condemn it in every instance. Uh, if, uh, if, if, if a man or is married to a woman or a woman to a man, and the spouse uh, has, has, has sexual relations with somebody else, God permits the innocent party to divorce. The trouble is our culture is so godless that divorce, is, that adultery isn't even the chief concern of courts anymore. And so we're faced with that. The Apostle Paul says if the unbeliever depart, let him depart. The Christian isn't bound. And so we have always said malicious desertion where the person takes off and leaves the spouse is also grounds for divorce. So uh, in those cases, a Christian is not bound. Sexual intimacy is a, is a sign, a seal, it's a, of the marriage itself. And, and for someone to have sexual relations with somebody else is itself to, to, to break that marriage. And I, in, in my ministry, I have run across very few but some cases where a woman was married to a man and she said, doggone it, I want him back. He's going to do what's right. And they went through the, he went through the confession, the absolution. He promised again. She took him back. They lived another 30 years together. But if the woman or the man just keeps on doing it, <laughs> and then there's no repentance, I don't see how you can have reconciliation in a case like that. Yeah? Question about uh, then you. children outside of marriage. I mean, in my office, there's, you know, it doesn't seem like a frowned upon thing anymore. It's just... What outside of sex outside of marriage? Children outside of marriage. Yeah. Well, it sure makes it harder to raise them. When, when Mark was a little boy, we moved down to Racine, Wisconsin. He had blacks, whites, and Hispanics. And uh, race had little to do with crime. The absence of fathers was a bigger, much bigger factor than, than, than any other. And so I guess I would just encourage young girls. I know there's a double standard, but men can't get pregnant. I mean, it's equally sinful for a man to have sex outside of marriage as it is for a woman, but a man doesn't have a womb. And these, I think we need to really, really teach our young ladies, this is something God gave you that you don't give. Yes, the men too, but, but the point is, why does a woman let herself get into that position if not because some guy has convinced her that he loves her? Well, how is a guy going to get it from a woman? How is he going to be able to get what he wants from a woman to convince her that he loves her? He's not, she's not going to put out for him unless he convinces her of that. So tell the young ladies they're lying when they say they love you. <laughs> if they're sticking their hands where they don't belong and they say they love you, you know what that means. They want to use you. So, but no, I agree. It's, it's very, and it's tough on the kids. But it's not the death sentence. Single parents can raise kids. You bring them to church. You bring them to Bible class. You have devotions at home, a single mom or a single a dad is going to do better for that child than a married couple that neglects the Word of God. So that I'd like to emphasize. Yes? Um, what comfort would you, do you offer to the couple that you know, comes to you and says, that's what we, you know, stop having kids because we thought that's what we're supposed to do, and now we're, it's too late, we're sorry, and we're Well, you know, one of the things. This genuinely grieving the fact that they don't know why they do that. Yeah. One of the things that's hard to learn that as a pastor, I knew this when I was ordained, but I've never really learned it because I'm like a human being. <laughs> but you don't ever comfort them with the law. The law, no peace can ever give, no comfort and no blessing. You always comfort them with the gospel. That's, that's what I would say. So if. People, they make mistakes, they didn't do right, they, they, they did wrong by their children or whatever. You don't say, well, you did the best you could, well this, well that. You don't do that. You simply say, yeah, that's right. 
You are a poor, miserable sinner for whom Jesus died, shed his blood, and God has removed your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. And you know what else? Not only that, God's going to give you opportunities in your life to do things that in the past you didn't do. He always does that. that, that, that that's what the, the, the new life is all about. So I would just caution not to comfort people with the law, especially when it comes to mistakes we've made in raising our kids, because they know a whole lot better than you know what they did and didn't do, you know? It's like eulogizing the dead person, and the family's sitting there, oh, you did not know my mother. <laughs> Preach the gospel instead, you know? I, I think we might be out of time. It's five after the hour. Is this done then? Okay, so then tomorrow we're going to talk about dads.